Uh, welcome. Uh, this is Reno Grand Rounds. It's presented by me, I'm Cameron. Uh, uh, I'm sure most of you have. And um, I'm going to present uh, on atypical renal infections. And what kind of brought about this discussion was just kind of seeing cases of uh, uh, infections involving renal disease that um, I didn't know much about. And so I wanted to kind of talk about a few of them. Um, I can't talk about all of them because there's so many diseases that causes renal infection. So I chose three. So our topics are going to be mainly on um, uh, renal tuberculosis, uh, aspergillosis, and then also uh, aspergillosis and uh, renal parvovirus. So we're going to start with the case. Um, it was a 41-year-old male sent to the ED by his primary care physician for a blood glucose of 400. And according to the patient, uh, he has a history of diabetes that was controlled by diet and exercise, and he was complaining of cough for about three weeks. In the ED, um, they did a chest X-ray, and that showed a right upper lobe pneumonia. And uh, they did a BMP and was noted to have a serum creatinine of 2.0. And from previous records, um, they had seen they had a baseline of about 1.3. So he had some AKI and his blood glucose was 458. And, um, and so in the ED, they diagnosed him with pneumonia, hyperglycemia and dehydration. And they gave him IV insulin, um, two liters of IV fluids, um, some IV uh, antibiotics, and then they rechecked his labs and his glucose had dropped to 254. His serum creatinine had improved to 1.7, still above his baseline. And they felt that he was okay for discharge. So they discharged him from the ED and he was actually sent out um, um, on like about a week of antibiotics. Um, two weeks later, um, he had returned to the emergency department. Uh, in between that, he had actually gone to his primary care provider and he got a uh, um, levofloxacin as around antibiotics because he was not feeling better. And uh, he, was, he was having some more, more progressive cough and he was now complaining of weight loss, vomiting and fatigue. And so back in the ED, they did get a repeat BMP. And now um, as you see, it's some pretty significant hyponatremia, um, some mild hyperkalemia. He has uh, metabolic acidosis, um, hyperglycemia, and now his creatinine had jumped up to 4.3. And they did a VBG and he was pretty acidotic at pH of 7.1, a CO2 of 33, a PO2 of 44, and a bicarb of 11.1. And his uh, CBC had a white blood cell count of 13. So this time they admitted him. Um, they started him on a bicarb drip. Um, because he has significant AKI, they got a uh, uh, renal ultrasound. It showed severe bilateral hydronephrosis, um, distated bladder with some debris in it. And so they consulted urology, they started them on Flomax and they, uh, they placed a Foley. And after they repeated a BMP, a stem creatinine was about three. And so their initial start workup, they did a UA, a urine culture, blood cultures, and uh, a repeat chest X-ray was done, which showed the repeat chest X-ray showed like just a um, up, right upper lobe pneumonia and a possible um, left upper lobe pneumonia as well. And so he was started on IV antibiotics. And this was his urinary analysis. They showed large leukocyte esterase. Um, that was so important that you can see that he had some proteinuria, um, some blood in his urine, a lot of white blood cells, some red blood cells, and, and it said trace bacteria. And so on emission day three, um, after his initial blood cultures and urine cultures, everything came back negative. So because of the x ray that showed pneumonia that wasn't improved um, um, and his urine uh, studies. On hospital day five, the patient had persistent fevers, respiratory distress and wheezing. They consulted ID. They had noted that he had sterile pyuria and requested for a repeat chest X-ray and a CT scan. So they did a CT chest, abdomen and pelvis and it showed extensive cavitary process within the right upper lobe with scattered uh, micronodule infiltrates in the mid, upper, right, and left upper lobe, an appearance that was highly suspicious for active TB. And there, there was also markedly abnormal appearance of the right kidney uh, and marked chronic hydronephrosis with diffuse thinning and irregularities overlying the cortical parenchyma 
and irregular wall thickening enhancement of the ureter and renal pelvis. Um, and they felt that in light of this, this was likely consistent with urinary involvement of tuberculosis. And so infectious disease ordered an AFB smear of the sputum uh, times three, and it was two plus, three plus, and four plus positive for acid fast bacteria. And then after that, they ordered a urine acid fast bacteria test, and now it was positive, and they confirmed uh, uro TB. Here's the imaging of a CT of his right kidney. Um, as you can see, as like this really dilated pelvis, they felt that it was the cortical thinning. The left kidney actually looks pretty good um, to show that, considering that they felt they had bilateral disease. Um, but if you look, they actually got a renal ultrasound, and the left kidney had significant uh, dilation in the pelvis as well, and uh, as well as the right kidney. So significant bilateral disease, although. Um, it looks like as far as how the left kidney looks compared to the right kidney, the left kidney looked some, uh, more preserved. And so urology had also done a, a, a bladder biopsy and it showed some hyalinized uh, calcified granulomas within the bladder wall um, consistent with tuberculosis. And so they diagnosed him with pulmonary renal urinary tuberculosis. And he was started on drug therapy with isoniazide, with fampin, ethambrazole, and uh, uh, PZA and, he, and vitamin B6. And Reno was consulted on hospital day nine, mostly um, for outpatient follow-up. And uh, at this time, he had a fully placed, his serum had dropped, drop, creatinine had dropped to 1.4. They tried to do a voiding, voiding trial. However, he failed the voiding trial and he was discharged with a Foley catheter on hospital day 10. And he was set up to follow up with urology after his isolation was complete, as well as a renal follow-up. So I'm going to talk a little bit about renal tuberculosis, and we'll kind of get back to um, how this patient did. Um, and so we'll talk about epidemiology, pathophys, diagnosis, and treatment. So um, obviously tuberculosis is a disease caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis, and the disease remains uh, an important public health problem, mostly in developing countries. Um, and extra pulmonary TB, so TB outside of the lungs, uh, became a uh, common infection with patients with hum uh, HIV and also with patients with transplant and those with poorly controlled diabetes. And about 27% of patients who have extra pulmonary TB have urogenital TB or renal TB, um, which is third most after pleural TB and lymphatic TB, but really it's about one third, one third, one third. So they each represent about a third of extra pulmonary TB. And the, the problem that happens in urogenital TB or renal TB is that because it has this kind of like slow onset, um, patients don't present with symptoms a lot often of, of renal symptoms. The diagnosis and treatments are sometimes delayed. And so you get a higher rate of like organ destruction and development of renal uh, failure. And so um, in the US, uh, Urogenital TB represents about 3% of the world TB cases. Um, renal tuberculosis cases are about 90% in developing countries and 10% in developed countries. And it affects men about twice as much as it affects women. And generally these men are around the age of our patient that we saw earlier, which is about 40 to 50 years old. And the interesting thing about uh, tuberculosis infections Oh, and with renal development is that it's not an ascending infection of the kidney, it's actually a descending infection. So what happens is you get these pulmonary, pulmonary lesions and they, you get these multiply, multiplying of the macrophages um, with the tuberculosis and they'll be next to a blood vessel likely within the lung and there'll be vessel erosion. And that causes systemic uh, uh, tuberculosis to get into systemic circulation, which reaches the kidneys. Once it reaches the kidneys, um, you can get like granulomas with the kidneys, or you might just have like um, some leukocytosis, hematuria, proteinuria, um, or you might have a full-on pyelonephritis. And then from there on, you can get uh, uh, infection within the ureter and the bladder wall thickening, which can be consistent with like granulomas in there or papillary necrosis within the kidney and that all these things kind of together can lead to uh, renal insufficiency, obstructive neuropathy, and, and then end-stage renal disease. So there is classifications um, 
like stage one, they consider like a non-obstructive form. They usually people present with like this leukocyte, leukocyturia, a hematuria, proteinuria. And then you have like small early uh, destructive form, which maybe they started having um, um, some changes within the glomerulus where they have like um, some granulomas within the glomeruli as well. And then you have the destructive form of stage three, which you start getting like actual like large granulomas um, within the renal pelvis. And then widespread destructive is when you start getting the papillary necrosis and it kind of encompasses uh, all, every aspect of uh, the tuberculosis def, uh, destruction on the kidney. And then you likely are gonna lead to end-stage renal disease, especially if you have bilateral disease. And so how do these patients present? 50% um, of, of case uh, present with complaints of urinary frequency, incomplete boarding or incontinence. Um, the lab studies found usually include an AKI or renal failure, proteinuria, um, sterile pyuria, and sometimes, you know, you might just see instantly find like bladder defects or distortions in the ureter on ultrasound or CT. And this was a study, uh, this was a, this was looking at a bunch of different studies of patients with renal tuberculosis and their presenting symptoms. And they kind of looked at different symptoms where they had dysuria and frequency, pain, uh, problems with voiding, uh, hematuria, abdominal pain, fistula, renal failure, scrotal pain, or scrotal abscess or fistula. And essentially, like, it's pretty variable and, uh, about what uh, type of symptoms they, they might have. And sometimes they might not have symptoms at all. But obviously, the most common thing that you see is that the patients present more likely with just urinary frequency and dysuria, which is kind of sometimes can be vague. So um, there was a study about the incidence of urine uh, culture positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis in the general tuberculosis population. And so what they did is they took just a patients who were diagnosed with tuberculosis and they tested them all for urinary tuberculosis. And uh, 33 patients, about 10% were positive for urinary uh, had positive urinary cultures for tuberculosis. And um, what they said is about 22 of those 32 patients actually did not have any symptoms at all. And they also found that like a large percent of the patients had, 58% um, uh, had normal urinary analysis. And then also like a large percent, 58% had completely normal like imaging as well. And so the conclusion from this study was that the lack of symptoms and normal tests um, does not necessarily exclude uh, renal, renal urinary TB. And this suggests that maybe we should, anybody who has tuberculosis infection that is diagnosed, we should actually just test the urine just to make sure to have, understand, uh, confirm or diagnose the extra pulmonary tuberculosis and also kind of have an idea of how much further investigation they, they should get into their um, kidneys with like ultrasound or CT. And so, um, these diagnostics test for diagnosing urinary microbiome uh, renal tuberculosis. You can do a urine uh, mycobacterial culture, which is like 90% sensitive and 100% specific, but it takes like sometimes up to like two months to come back. Uh, most popular is usually just doing a urine acid fast uh, bacilli cultures, and those um, are pretty high sensitivity, 80 and 90% specific, and those come back pretty quickly. Um, urine PCR can also be done, which is 87 to 100%, uh, 87 to 100% sensitive and pretty specific, 93 to 98%. And then also you can do a renal biopsy. Uh, certain patients do get renal biopsy and they stain with AFB and it will show um, some of uh, the uh, mycobacterium within the uh, the biopsy itself. So here's kind of a picture of that. Um, this patient got a renal biopsy after they were suspicious for um, mycobacterium tuberculosis in their urine. And you can see that there's these uh, positive acid fast uh, bacteria uh, within uh, the glomeruli and within the, uh, the tubules. Um, so uh, there is actually like, so like I said, you have those classifications, but there's like these, there's uh, different ways that it actually affects the kidney within those, uh, within that, those classifications. And so I wanted to kind of break that down. So there's obstruction along the genital urinary tract. Um, there's interstitial nephritis, 
there's uh, glomerulonephritis that it causes and amyloidosis that they can cause as well. So typical picture of someone who has renal, uh, obstruction is kind of what we saw earlier. This is a patient who has bilateral obstruction and you see they have um, dilation of uh, uh, the renal parenchyma and you see like it's, um, there looks like there's like some thinning around the cortex. And this is like a typical case of patients, a CT of patient who has bilateral involvement of the um, of renal tuberculosis. This here uh, is a like a uh, venous uh, urogram. And it, what, what they show is like there's strictures within uh, your ureter as well as like dilated calyces here. And this is, they actually call it this pathognomonic. If patient has um, positive cultures and you see this as patient has pretty significant uh, renal tuberculosis disease um, in urogenital tuberculosis. And this is a picture of a patient who um, develop these granulomas throughout the, uh, the kidney. And so it can be a pretty significant disease and destructive disease. Obviously this kidney um, is you know, no longer uh, working and productive at all. Um, so interstitial nephritis can also uh, happen from tuberculosis infection. Um, it's, it's thought that there can be like an immunologic phenomenon uh, that causes the indirect interstitial nephritis most of the times what they see is these uh, interstitial nephritis with these chronic caseating granulomas within the kidney itself. And this is kind of a picture of that, uh, of a kidney biopsy. There's this uh, caseating granulomas with some central necrosis and uh, giant cells. And they, they, they find this along with interstitial nephritis typically in patients with uh, renal tuberculosis who get biopsy. Um, you know, glomerulonephritis with uh, renal tuberculosis can be um, um, difficult to kind of ascertain because a lot of the case presentations, um, there's like a wide range of histology and pathophysiology. And a lot of times, a lot of them have underlying like other reasons that they could have glomerulonephritis. So it's difficult to tell whether it's from the uh, tuberculosis or not. However, they did show that it's possible like 20% of renal tuberculosis patients can develop glomerulonephritis in a, a one odd study, but it's, um, it's really not well defined. Um, here's a typical case of a patient who had glomerulonephritis um, from, with a positive renal tuberculosis, and they developed like, you know, crescent uh, formation within uh, the glomerulus itself. And so it, the glomerulonephritis is also something that happens within renal tuberculosis as well. And lastly, um, amyloidosis. Um, in patients with uh, tuberculosis, um, renal amyloidosis is due to chronic infl inflammation, systemic inflammation, and you get high circulations of these acute phase reactants, and then you develop um, these serum amyloid A proteins. And this is kind of what that looks like as well. Um, you get these development of serum amyloid A proteins uh, within the glomerulus. And you can see there's like a lot of uh, deposition of material here within the glomerulus. So then over here, this is kind of a higher stain on a Congo red um, with a Congo red stain. And you can see um, the amyloid presence within the glomerulus itself. And so treatment um, for tuberculosis um, it's typically uh, drug therapy with RIPE, which includes rifampin, isoniazid, uh, pyrazinamide, ethambutol for at least six months. And it's followed by repeat testing. Uh, because many of these patients are immunocompromised, they require like sometimes prolonged therapy. And then in patients with ureteral strictures um, and hydronephrosis, you can do stenting uh, percutaneous nephrostomy tubes. Uh, can be beneficial in static obstruction nephropathy um, that is potentially reversible. And so, um, like I said, along with that, there's a, a surgical interventions like that are preserved mainly um, uh, for patients with bilateral disease. And those, those patients with bilateral disease sometimes have to undergo nephrectomy um, and dilation of the ureteral strictures and bladder diversion. So uh, just to kind of sum up, and with these, with our patients, the devastation of the disease. So for our patient with our urinary uh, renal tuberculosis, within six months, um, he had to have several replacements of his Foley catheter and he was in and out of the hospital and he had a right stent placed uh, in, his, in the ureter and he had, was diagnosed with chronic kidney disease stage three. 
by the end of the first year um, after his diagnosis of renal tuberculosis, um, he had frequent urinary tract infections, um, probably from like the strictures within the ureter and his kidney function at worst, he had episode of pyelonephritis and uh, he was diagnosed with CKD stage four. And he was there uh, at CKD stage four for a few years. And after five years of after his diagnosis, he developed end-stage renal disease and he was started on hemodialysis. And most recently, um, seven years after his diagnosis, um, and remember he was 41, so he's still in his 40s, 48 years old. He developed a right renal abscess due to frequent infections. It was draining pus and blood. His left kidney at this point, uh, he had already had so much obstruction. They had placed a, a perp nef tube previously, um, but it was uh, no longer making urine. And he had a pile of to the left kidney previously too. And so um, they, it was decided that, you know, in the consideration of him having so much uh, infection and burden that they would do a complete urinary system removal uh, with bilateral nephrectomy and simple cystectomy. So they completely removed his urinary system completely. And so, um, and remember, he's, this is a gentleman who's in his 40s, so this is pretty significant. He actually had a complex uh, hospital course um, that, uh, but um, he is actually out of the hospital now doing well. So in conclusion, um, renal tuberculosis um, is an underdiagnosed infection. Um, late diagnosis can have devastating long-term effects. And because of that, you know, we can consider screening all, screening the urine for all tuberculosis patients, especially those with HIV, um, immunocompromised patients, transplant patients, or poorly controlled diabetes mellitus. And the presentation that you'll typically see is like um, sterile pyuria, and then the diagnosis with a, a urine culture, typically an AFB culture of the urine to kind of confirm the diagnosis. And typically, if you have that, you want to do some imaging um, is a helpful tool to look at whether the patient has further descending disease from the kidney, whether they have ureteral involvement or bladder involvement. And that kind of gives you some idea of how their long-term outcome might be, especially if they have, if you find they have bilateral disease. And then obviously treatment, as we said before, six months with ripe therapy. However, a lot of times it has to be uh, prolonged because patients are usually immunocompromised and sometimes they have persistent uh, pyuria. Okay, so that kind of sums up uh, renal tuberculosis. And uh, does anyone have any questions before I move on? I have a quick question. Hi, Cam, it's sure. Sophie. Hey. Um, do you happen to know what the penetration is to the renal parenchyma with the treatment, the right treatment? Is there any data on that? Um, you know, I didn't see much data on like what the penetration, I mean, from what I've seen, there's pretty good clearance with the treatment, um, but not specifically, this is the, the exact data on renal uh, penetration, but typically there's resolution of disease after treatment. It's just a lot of times just residual, like long-term effects of what was already, the damage that was already there. So, okay, we're gonna move on to a next case. So we have a 66 year old man. Um, he presented with complaints of intermittent high grade fevers, um, generalized dull aching abdominal pain for three months. And he had a history of passing turbid urine and decreased output and swelling in both feet for about 10 days. And his physical exam was significant by, for bilateral flank tenderness. His heart rate, he was tachycardic and his blood pressure was 110 over 70. And essentially, uh, they got a BMP with him coming into the emergency department. His, he had some hyponatremia. He had significant AKI with creatinine of 5.3 and a BUN of 124. His albumin was also 2.2. And his white blood cell count was 8.1, not super high, but his UA had numerous white blood cells. Um, leukocyte esterase was positive, but his nitrites were negative. Um, so they got an ultrasound his kidney. They, they revealed enlarged kidneys with bilateral renal abscess, and he went, underwent emergent ultrasound-guided drainage of his renal abscess. And this is kind of what that looked like. These are his kidneys with uh, his right and left kidneys, and you can see that there was pockets of, of pus and fluid with him representing a renal abscess there. 
And so the pus smear from the renal abscess um, from both sides, so septated fungi, fungi, and they were discussing which treatment to start, but he was initiated actually on amphotericin B considering how uh, his clinical picture and his uh, cultures from both renal abscess uh, revealed growth of aspergillus uh, fumigatus. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this uh, aspergillus uh, fumigatus as well. So um, renal aspergillosis, um, it's kind of a rare disease. It often occurs in immunocompromised patients. We see it often um, in transplant patients and it has three different patterns of uh, infection. It can have, you can have disseminated disease, sort of like tuberculosis where you get disseminated disease from the blood into the, the kidneys and then kind of have a descending um, infection along the urogenital tract. Um, sometimes you just have isolated infection within the renal pelvis with these bezoar formations. Um, and I'll show you those a little bit later. Bezoar formations are typically like within the uh, like gut and it kind of represents like this undigestible material in the gut and in the kidneys is kind of just like a, um, a buildup of material from the infection that that forms within the, uh, the renal pelvis and, uh, and you'll get a picture of that. Um, and then you also can just get a typical ascending uh, panurothelial aspergillosis as well. So there was a case series done about renal aspergillosis where they looked at antiportum and postmortem diagnosis of renal aspergillosis, aspergillosis and 27 patients, 63% um, of them had disseminated infection and 37% had that isolated infection, which is, um, if you remember, that was these, this last two section, these isolated infections then, uh, but the majority had disseminated infection. And what they found was 55% of the patients um, had renal failure during their hospital course. And the mortality rate associated with renal aspergillosis was 81%. So pretty significant um, despite finding it um, during the course. And the thing, the difficult thing to, to, that they didn't kind of go into in this case, in this series was whether um, their diagnosis was um, before or after mortem. So I, I can't say whether the patients were diagnosed, um, had, had known aspergillus prior to, uh, renal aspergillus prior, prior to their, their death. Um, that might have been treated a little more aggressively. Um, so predisposing factors. Um, Typically, it's immunocompromised patients, transplant patients. Um, they've seen it in prolonged courses of antibiotics, patients who are on steroids, uh, prolonged indwelling prolonged catheters, diabetics, and IV drug users. Um, symptoms are typically obstructive, similar to those with patients with uh, BPH. And a large percentage of patients who do have disseminated disease um, find renal involvement on autopsy, like I said, you know, the, the studies didn't say whether or not, but the belief is that it's a large percentage is on autopsy and it can be silent. And the patient may pass like a mass like formation, which are those bezoars in the urine. They might, they might pass small ones um, and they may complain of renal colic. Um, so diagnosis is usually patients present with sterile pyuria. Um, patients with high suspicion should undergo uh, fungal urine cultures, uh, which has a high sensitivity. And then renal imaging with either CT or ultrasound um, might show hydronephrosis with filling defects in the renal pelvis. And then a retro uh, urethrogram could show these beef resor formations as well. And so this is kind of what it looks like. Um, this is a like a nephroscope looking at the, the kidneys with the bezoar formation inside of it. And then this is after they did uh, endoscopic removal of the bezoar formation. And like I said, it's this kind of waxy material that forms as a part of the uh, um, uh, formation of renal aspergillosis. And so treatment is typically with voriconazole is a mainstay of treatment in these patients. Because a majority of them are immunocompromised, they do recommend adding a secondary uh, an, um, antifungal with capsule fungin or microfungin. And then amphotericin B is typically given to those who seem to have like significant resistance to the above disease, like they're not clearing it um, uh, with, you know, a two drug therapy. And then uh, surgical intervention is usually done to limit obstruction, like as above where you saw with those bezoar formations. And so uh, there's, there's, you know, not much data and studies done around um, how much we could treat this 
But idea is that, you know, if we treat the infection early, it gives a patient the best chance. Um, so just kind of go back to what happened to our patient. Um, his hospital stay was complicated by um, worsening renal function, uh, acute pulmonary edema, and hyperkalemia with metabolic acidosis. As you remember, his serum creatinine was 5.3, and his BUN was 124. And so they initiated him on hemodialysis, and they had him on a BiPAP as well. As well. And then, however, um, on hospital day nine, he actually had a cardiac arrest, and they did not achieve ROSC. So pretty significant uh, course. And so that kind of goes along with the patients who get this renal aspergillosis has a pretty high mortality rate. Um, does anybody have questions? We're gonna go on to our next one after this um, about aspergillosis. All right, so our next case um, is a 36 year old Caribbean woman. She has uh, um, G4P2012. Uh, um, she presented an eight weeks gestation with one week history of worsening swelling in her hands and feet. And um, she had no past medical history. Um, all previous pregnancies did not have any complications. And to date, her, her current medical course was stable. Approximately uh, one month prior to presentation, her four year old daughter had experienced a classic presentation of a fifth disease from Parvo B19. And um, they did an ultrasound of the fetus and it was a uh, uh, fetal demise and she underwent dilation and curatage of the procedure. And with a known history of parvovirus contacts, they just diagnosed her with an active infection. They felt that um, she likely had a Parvo B19 infection, and she, but she wasn't, um, they didn't do any further like uh, testing at that time. Um, uh, except for they did get a BMP and they saw that her, so, her sodium was normal, potassium was normal, her bicarb was 22. She had a creatinine 6.3, uh, which is, was way higher than her baseline, and albumin is actually really low at 1.5. They did a spot UPCR, and it was 20 grams per gram. And they also did a Parvo B19 PCR, and it was approximately 2,000 copies uh, within the Parvo virus. Uh, which they felt was like not a large amount of copies of Parvo B19, but would say that she did have an infection going on. So they did a renal ultrasound. Um, there was normal bilateral kidney sizes, um, but there was uh, and no hydronephrosis, cyst or calcifications. And then hospital day three, she did have a biopsy. Um, and it, they felt that this was showing that the patient had like some crescent, crescent I mean, um, collapsing. Um, and significant changing uh, polar side effacements and within the glomerulus. And so they actually started around 60 milligrams of prednisone daily. And so we're gonna talk about parvovirus and kidney disease. So parvovirus um, B19 is a non-enveloped single-stranded DNA. Um, we're kind of the only host for this type of infection, which is typically acquired during childhood. And approximately 50% of children, uh, they believe have it by 15 years old, like I've had it. And that actually increases like 85% by adulthood. So maybe just a transient uh, infection that goes noticed or unnoticed um, from the time of your childhood to adulthood. And transmission usually occurs by inhalation of virions uh, through uh, aerosol droplets. And this is kind of how it infects the cell. You get these uh, parvovirus and has these, what's called like VP1 and VP2 um, proteins on the outside of it that allow it to uh, uh, connect to like these uh, glycoproteins on the cell wall. And then it gets, uh, it, it gets uh, phagocytized essentially and you get endocytosis and then it comes, you get an endosome and it comes into the cell and then it replicates. There's also this formation of this NS1 that comes from the virus and what that actually uh, triggers the cell to cause apoptosis. So essentially you get viral production and then lots of cell death for any type of cell that it infects. And so um, it's from the uh, Advanced Chronic Kidney Disease uh, Journal from 2019 and they were showing what type of things can happen from uh, parvovirus involving kidney disease. And we kind of know it for like aplastic crisis and pure uh, 
blood cell plasia. Um, as far as looking at the kidneys themselves, uh, the most common things you see is proliferative glomerulonephritis, a collapsing glomerulo, uh, glomerulopathy, and then focal segmental glomerulosclerosis are by far the most popular that you see. Um, it can also be associated with some of these um, autoimmune uh, significant findings as well with uh, um, the thrombotic microangiopathies, Hanak-Schwinn and polyarthritis and microscopic polyangitis. And so this is kind of a typical um, um, biopsy of a person who had parvo-19 uh, inf uh, infection and they felt that there was like hypertrophy of the podocytes and then um, they showed that there was like a collapsing formation of the glomerulus. And this is typically kind of what you would see in the effects of a parvo B19. So um, how do you diagnose it? Um, typically what you see is a patient get an ELISA test. These are usually immunocompetent uh, um, and immunocompetent patients. Patients who are immunocompromised typically get a viral DNA by PCR. Either method works. Um, I probably feel that the PCR is probably the best. <laughs> And then treatment, unfortunately, so how do we treat these patients? Um, there's not a specific treatment design to help parvo kidney disease. Um, there is currently like no antiviral therapy. And in most cases, um, this is like a transient kidney injury, but like I said, you can develop these glomerulonephropathy as it can be long lasting. If they are having significant infection and the patient is immunocompromised, some people have tried giving IVIG, but there's like not really much studies about how much that's helped. And then um, you can also reduce uh, immunosuppressants in transplant patients to try and clear the infection uh, quicker. And so um, just kind of back to um, our patient. So uh, like I said, she had significant um, protein urea and anything they said with parvo B19 virus, like anything like above like 10 grams, like had significantly worse outcomes. And so three weeks into the hospitalization, she was actually discharged home on prednisone and diuretics. And she returned six days later. Um, she had gained 40 pounds um, since her uh, discharge uh, above her baseline weight and her albumin was 1.0, so she had significant proteinuria. And they also found her hemoglobin was five, and which is uh, that anemic association, association with parvovirus B19 infection. And so they did supportive care. They transfused her with pack red blood cells. However, over the next few weeks, um, with the attempt of supportive care and steroids, uh, she had no improvement in her renal function. And she got more acidotic hyperkalemic. And so they actually had to start on hemodialysis. And after two months of hemodialysis, she actually became completely aneuric uh, without renal recovery. She was then placed on a transplant list. So um, the mainstay of understanding these kind of diseases, and the reason why I brought it up is because I wanted to kind of know what we could do um, in, in regards to these infections, kind of know that these infections actually like have significant kidney disease and poor outcomes. And the idea is that uh, if someone comes in with these infections, uh, in types of infections or these types of infections are there um, with aspergillus, uh, tuberculosis, you know, we should actually be probably, you know, making sure they all have urine studies to make sure that there is no renal involvement because uh, the renal involvement can be pretty significant. And um, although like uh, treatment does not change much, with, re with understanding renal involvement, um, the way we manage and do follow-ups does change um, because these patients who have like maybe obstructive disease need like frequent BMPs just to make sure they ha don't have like a new obstruction so they can have it fixed sooner um, because the longer they go with their obstructions, the uh, quicker they're gonna go downhill to having uh, end-stage renal disease. So um, that's kind of it. Does anyone have any questions? Can. That was very nice. A, a quick question on the aspergillosis section. Yes. Is there a little bit more data about incidence or prevalence in kidney transplant patients? Just yeah. Better? So there is there is a good amount of data and prevalence in kidney transplant patients, but um, I didn't want to like go too much because there's a there's like a much larger section just on kidney transplant alone. Um, so I didn't go too much in that, but. Typically, the, the idea is that the kidney transplant patients have 
pre the highest um, amount of aspergillosis infections um, amongst like um, all patients with any type of, uh, of uh, um, immunocompromised. So it's, it's really affects the kidney transplant patients pretty significantly. Thanks, Ken. All right. Well, thank Very you. Good. Guys. Great Thanks job. Again.